tutti, eh, è il mio onore di nuovo presentare il prossimo ospite di, questa, di questo ciclo di seminari, EST, quindi Egyptological Seminars Under the Tower. Oggi abbiamo Richard Busman, il professor Busman è professore di egittologia all'Università di Colonia e eh, ha ottenuto il dottorato presso la Frei Universität, Universität di Berlino e uh, nel 2010 giusto, è diventato lecturer all'Institute of Archaeology UCL di Londra, dove ha insegnato egittologia, quindi la lingua, ma anche ha insegnato uh, archeologia egiziana. E, uh, Richard dirige uh, insieme con una missione congiunta, insieme con l'Università di Pisa, la missione fortunatamente ci ha messo la fotografia qui, la missione di Azavet e Meitin, per chi non la conoscesse siamo nel Medio Egitto, siamo vicino alla città di Minia e il sito è un sito che occupa, che parte praticamente dal predinastico e arriva fino al periodo copto islamico, quindi praticamente attraversa tutta la storia egiziana, escluso il Medio Regno, il Medio Regno proprio lo salta in pieno <ride> e infatti l'abbiamo selezionato appositamente perché non c'era il Medio Regno e quindi siamo andati a scalare lì. E anche grazie a Richard che molte, eh, che alcuni studenti di voi sono venuti già a scavare da due anni, abbiamo cominciato nel 2013 la prima missione in cui era solo Richard praticamente, e poi abbiamo fatto una sarde, abbiamo cominciato lo scavo l'anno eh, scorso, e grazie anche a Richard che molti studenti dell'Università di Pisa hanno avuto l'opportunità di andare sul sito e eh, probabilmente avranno in futuro l'opportunità di andare a scavare direttamente su questo sito, in questo sito di Zavo. Eh, e Richard è autore di eh, numerosissimi articoli sia in riviste scientifiche sia in atti di congressi e eh, è conosciuto principalmente per due grandi volumi, uno è eh, Deep Province Temple eh, Egyptians e un altro è uscito da poco, nel 2016-2017, è uh, The Complete Middle Egyptian, uh, A New Method for Understanding Hieroglyphs, cioè un'introduzione un alla lingua geroglifica, quindi chiunque eh, non vuole cominciare subito con Allen o con il Gardiner, gli consiglio vivamente di andarsi a leggere questo nuovo libro di... Uh, egittologia di, di lingua egiziana perché eh, è un'ottima un introduzione per, eh, per approcciarsi alla lingua e eh, ovviamente gli interessi principali di Richard non per sto illustrare potete andare su Google e li andate a cercare però sono la social archaeology soprattutto e cultural anthropology ed è interessato al periodo di transizione tra il periodo arcaico quindi alla formazione dello stato egiziano che va dal periodo arcaico fino al medio regno e soprattutto, come vedete oggi, anche all'archeologia della religione. Non rubo altro tempo, penso che sia il caso di invitare Richard direttamente a uh, presentare l'argomento di oggi. Grazie mille. Uh, grazie Gianluca. My Italian is very rusty, so I think it's better I speak in English. But please, uh, can you hear me okay? Okay, um, so uh, thank you Gianluca for this introduction, thank you also to uh, Professor Petrov for inviting me here to uh, Pisa. It's a great uh, pleasure to be here, A, uh, because Italy is just a beautiful country, every time I arrive here I think, wow, this is so beautiful here, but then of course at Pisa, uh, Pisa, the Egyptology department is so clearly visible uh, in the Egyptological landscape that I was curious to know what's behind it here. Um, in terms of the building, in terms of the many students. It's great to see so many students attending this lecture. And then, of course, as Gianluca has just said, uh, we are running uh, together a fieldwork project at uh, Zawit Sultan. Uh, and so it was great to meet up uh, with Gianluca and other team members. So I doubt that some of uh, you here in the audience uh, also know uh, this view on the site. Uh, my topic uh, for this lecture uh, is uh, religious practice in ancient Egypt, a view from archaeology and anthropology. Uh, and I'd like to begin with a few broader comments on how we study religion in ancient Egypt. Um, I have put up here a few um, examples of syntheses uh, of ancient Egyptian religion uh, to 
show you what the, the kind of approach usually is taken for studying uh, ancient Egyptian religions. On the uh, left hand side, you see two volumes, one by Eric Hornung and one by Jan Asman in their English translation. Mm -hmm. And these two volumes, uh, which I think uh, make great contributions to understanding uh, religion, these deal in the first place with the question how we model polytheism and monotheism, the belief in many gods and the belief in one god. Um, and I think this is uh, probably also a rather German tradition of looking at ancient Egyptian religions. So there are forerunners uh, to these books. Um, and um, um, the, um, in, in terms of the, uh, the presentation today, um, I would say that these books are interested in a history of ideas. It's about belief systems. So um, what did the ancient Egyptians believe in? Uh, what are the theological systems behind it? What you will find not in these books or only uh, randomly is people. So it's a, a, I would say it's a history of ideas without people. So we don't actually know whether all people of Egyptian society share the same beliefs. We also don't know what they did, whether their belief translated into actual practices. The third book in the row, Religion in Ancient Egypt, edited by Byron Schaefer, uh, comes more out of the um, English-speaking tradition, where there is a, a greater concern with uh, the social embedding of religion. So some of the papers uh, in this book uh, look more closely at people. And very recently, Stephen Quirk has published his uh, Exploring Religion in Ancient Egypt, uh, which again is a little bit more on the social side and also on the diversity of uh, Egyptian religion. And Stephen Quirk particularly questions the categories in which we approach ancient Egyptian religion. For example, polytheism and monotheism is uh, a rather greco uh, latin approach to religion. Are these terms actually fit to describe very well what we see in ancient Egypt? So what I'd like to do uh, today is to look more closely at practices. What did people actually do? And I'd like to discuss a few aspects of how this might change our uh, view on uh, ancient Egyptian religion. Another aspect is the focus on archaeology. There is often an implicit understanding that uh, images and texts are about ideology uh, and they're about the elite only uh, versus archaeology. And archaeology uh, tells us what uh, people really did uh, and also spreads more widely. Although I agree that there's a great potential for archaeology to uncover facets of ancient Egyptian culture that we don't see in images and texts, as always, it's not as simple. So if we look at one of these uh, standard temple uh, temples of ancient Egypt, the Luxor Temple, by standard I mean the standard decorations. So basically what you see is the king interaction with a deity. Uh, in this case, uh, Amenhotep uh, III with Amun-Ra. Um, and, uh, of course, we see here practice. This is religious practice. Uh, and we're looking here at images and texts. So, um, of course, images and texts also tell us something about practice. It's not only the archaeology. Um, uh, looking more closely, however, it's also interesting to note that the, what we see here on the slide is not what happened in the temple. What actually happened is that the priest would make offerings to the statue of a deity. So uh, these kinds of images and texts uh, are a way of communicating interpreted practice. It's not just the practice, but it's the interpretation of what happens in temple cults. So the interpretation here is only the king interacts in temple cult with um, a deity, whereas in fact we know from administrative documents uh, that the situation was a little bit different. Uh, so. Uh, um, we have practice here, but uh, as I said, it's interpreted uh, practice. Um, so this is one uh, theme I'd like to pick up in uh, my lecture. Um, another is um, an idea that emerged out of a seminar that I was teaching with students at Cologne on burial customs in ancient Egypt. And in the very first uh, session, I asked the students uh, what their uh, burial practices were like. So how do you bury, what, are the, what do the funerals that you've attended look like? 
and more or less uh, they came up with something that looks very similar to what we see here. It's randomly picked from Wikipedia, so methodologically not very robust. It just is an image for inspiration. So more or less you have a, uh, uh, a community that uh, uh, buries the dead in a coffin and usually the church would be involved. There's a little bit of variation, but I think many of the funerals that we know uh, here in Western Europe look like this. And then I asked the students, what do you believe happens in the afterlife? So what are your funerary beliefs? And there it appeared that they ranged from uh, dust to dust, ashes to ashes, nothing, finito, nothing happens, stop. And another student said, attending the same funeral, uh, said, um, I think it's more like a paradise structure. And a third student said, well, doesn't the Bible say so and so, but actually I don't think I, don't think I have any beliefs. So uh, basically here, what we see is a clash between funerary beliefs and funerary practice, which means that from this funeral um, alone, uh, you wouldn't be able to tell what people believe. At the same time, you couldn't extrapolate from the beliefs what people would do. Um, individuals, uh, if you ask individuals, um, why do you do this and that, they would usually come up with an explanation. So at an individual level, you would combine, you would make sense out of what you do. So you think there is a belief that underpins my practice. But as an outside analyzer, which we are for ancient Egypt, uh, I think there is this methodological problem that belief and practice may clash. Um, a similar observation has been made in modern India. Uh, you see here a procession of the statue of the goddess uh, Ganesha. Uh, and um, I suppose this is how we could picture also ancient Egyptian uh, processions. Usually when we see uh, temple decoration uh, showing uh, processions, we see um, a row of priests carrying a barge. There's no people, there's no interaction with the, uh, with the audience. But of course, again, this is an interpretation of what a procession was like. This is probably much closer to how ancient Egyptian processions looked like. So there were shops selling foods, uh, selling drinks, people becoming exciting, uh, exciting, singing, chanting, dancing. Um, so um, <clears throat> I think this is, uh, uh, we might uh, want to build analogies from, uh, from this kind of procession. The anthropologist Mecca Marriott in the 1950s published a book um, called Village India and he conducted field uh, research in the 1930s in, and 40s in India and um, at the occasion of such uh, processions he asked the people uh, what does this uh, statue mean, uh, what are we doing here uh, and I think he asked 10 people 10 different answers. So people basically, everybody had uh, his own or her own interpretation of what the statue means and what the practices mean. So it's a similar story, practice and belief, there's no clear uh, interrelation. Uh, and he framed uh, the, uh, his uh, article uh, in, in the book um, in terms of great and little traditions, whereby great traditions are central traditions uh, that are systemized and that are uh, that are modeled by priests, by uh, that means by specialists of speculative thought on the one hand, uh, and on the other there are little traditions, local religious traditions, in which great traditions are um, implanted. Uh, so what we basically see here is a piece of great tradition, the goddess Ganesha, embedded in local religious practice where great traditions often are reinterpreted and recontextualized in very different ways of how um, they uh, are envisioned uh, by specialists who govern the great tradition. So great little tradition is one of these uh, themes from anthropology that I've uh, tried to pick up in uh, Egyptology. Uh, one idea behind in anthropology, and I don't want to minimize a very complex and exciting discipline uh, to um, just a very few uh, thoughts, but one of the things that I'm interested in is that anthropology looks very closely to small-scale contexts of inquiry. So it would look at local contexts, village contexts. This is not true anymore today, so now there's an anthropology of urban elites. The discipline has changed a lot and uh, globalization plays a great role, but I think in essence uh, the theoretical threats and anthrop threats in anthropology derive from looking at local contexts, so very much uh, uh, similar to what we've seen on the previous side, how are big ideas and systemized thought 
how is this embedded in local communities? And the idea behind it is, if we want to understand people, you have to zoom in very closely to understand how people make sense out of the world. So uh, this is the general background about practice and belief and approaches to religion and the role of anthropology for my uh, lecture. In the first part, um, I would like to zoom in on the community shrines uh, of ancient Egypt, the local temples or community shrines, so rather small uh, temples that served uh, the uh, religious life of uh, smaller uh, communities. And the first is the uh, community located at, uh, on Elephantini Island, which many of you will uh, know. Uh, which is located in the south of uh, Egypt. Uh, so, um, I used the, this thing. So, which is uh, located over here, opposite modern Aswan, uh, which is a beautiful landscape. Um, Elephantini Island is located within the River Nile. And this is an image a shot from uh, Google Earth, how the, um, uh, the southern tip of the island looks today. Um, this is the archaeological zone. Um, and further to the north is the Nubian uh, village. Um, the archaeological zone today is uh, dominated by the late period and Roman temple dedicated to the god Knum. And we are interested, but this is a later, uh, a later temple, we are interested in the more ancient temple at the site, which is dedicated to the goddess Satet. Uh, and this is located over here. Uh, this temple is famous also for uh, archaeological reasons because when the excavators, the German Archaeological Institute, arrived here in the 1960s, they um, found the foundation of the late period temple of uh, uh, Sated, and they had the permission to dismantle the foundation and, you, and with the reused blocks that were used in the foundation to reconstruct uh, the temples of the earlier phases. So what we see here is a phase of the New Kingdom foundation, um, on top of which was the uh, late period foundation. And uh, this foundation, as you can see, is made of uh, a couple of reused uh, blocks. Many of them had inscriptions and uh, decoration. And in the center of the temple, uh, there was a shaft, uh, this one. Uh, when the foundation was then dismantled, um, it turned out that the entire temple, the late period temple, stood on top of a granite niche, so a, a rock niche made of uh, granite boulders, and the New Kingdom shaft reached down to the earliest layers of the temple. And this is where the Old Kingdom temple, the um, Old Kingdom, New Kingdom community shrine was located. I show you here the, four, uh, the phase four, uh, which is uh, the late Old Kingdom, approximately 2400 BC. So uh, you recognize here the granite boulders, the granite boulders and the shaft uh, of the New Kingdom went down into the sanctuary from here, down into the sanctuary of the Old Kingdom uh, community shrine, which means in the New Kingdom uh, it was attempted to establish a connection to the earliest uh, shrine. Uh, the temple itself um, has a sanctuary uh, located in between the boulders and a, a second room uh, that you see in the front, uh, which the excavator called a forecourt. Uh, and in the middle of the forecourt, there is a, a mud brick pedestal, uh, and you see a couple of uh, wooden posts attached to the pedestal here, and another set of uh, wooden, beam, uh, wooden posts over here and there. Uh, this is a rubbish deposit. Uh, this is a tank uh, that was probably filled with water. So we know from later texts from the temple that water becoming and the receding of the Nile flood was the principal theological uh, idea of this uh, cult. And probably already in the Old Kingdom, there was some uh, cultic activity uh, centered on water. Uh, this uh, shrine uh, is uh, rather famous in Egyptology because it is so exemplary for temple development from the small community shrine in the third millennium becoming a big temple uh, in the late period. Um, and, uh, but of course, when it was discovered, and still I think today, it uh, runs counter our usual ideas of an ancient Egyptian temple. So it's very different from the grand temples at Luxor and so forth. So this is a, a shrine that the local community uh, at Elephantini had uh, built. 
We don't have uh, much decoration or inscriptions that would tell us something about the religious ideas or the interpretive practice, as I've shown uh, earlier for the Luxor Temple. But the temple was full of archaeological material, uh, and uh, the set of objects that has been published are the, is the votive material uh, of the Old Kingdom. So these are votive objects, um, uh, such as uh, Fios uh, figurines um, showing uh, seated men and women uh, and children and boys and girls and baboons and crocodiles that you can see here. Also pieces of jewelry, so um, earrings. And uh, here in the corner, uh, you see a set of natural pebbles uh, that were the cheapest uh, um, type of votive object that basically everybody could afford. So if you wanted to purchase a Fios object, you already had to probably, I mean, this is what we assume, you had to pay for it. Uh, but for these kinds of pebbles, you could just pick them up from the ground. Um, so in principle, at least, uh, these were the cheapest type of votive objects. Um, these uh, votive objects have been found in archaeological context. Uh, you can see here a, a, an image uh, that is taken in front of the wall between the forecourt and the sanctuary. Um, and it is here that a um, deposit of votive objects was found. It means that the votive objects were for, first offered into the temple, probably together with a prayer or a thank you to the deity. Uh, so they were forced, first offered, and after a while they were collected and then in front of this wall. Um, it's interesting from the idea of religious practice, what is the practice that we're actually seeing here? Um, I think what we don't see is the votive practice, uh, the, uh, because uh, this is a secondary deposit. So what we see is the practice of having removed the objects and depositing them in front of the wall. So archaeology, unfortunately, is also not so uh, simple and straightforward. It would be great to say this is a votive practice, but I think we are already a step later. And uh, the other, um, uh, I think the other uh, yeah, a problem or question perhaps for interpretation is that it's great to see here a practice, but what we don't see here is who actually carry out the practice. Um, and uh, we don't know any of the ideas uh, behind the practice. So while I would argue that uh, archaeology just, uh, does, um, does show us practices that do not feature in text and images, so we see here different kind of uh, yeah, people at different kind of sanctuary that we don't know from text, so this is what archaeology shows, but there are also limitations uh, to uh, um, the ideas, to the uh, interpretation of what practice means in archaeological terms. So we don't have people, we don't have the ideas, so it's different from what we've seen on the Luxor uh, temple wall. Another practice that was centered on these votive objects is uh, that they were used secondarily for foundation uh, deposits. Uh, this is a foundation deposit below a pivot stone. So a pivot stone is a stone in which a door is set. Um, so here the excavators uh, removed the pivot stone on top of this deposit and below, uh, below the pivot stone uh, some uh, more ancient uh, votive objects were used and placed below them. We know this kind of practice from royal contexts very well. So royal foundation uh, deposits are well known. Um, this one dates from the early Old Kingdom. So I'm wondering whether the, the practice uh, of uh, foundation deposits is actually in origin not a royal practice, but it's something that developed uh, earlier before kingship and it's only something that kings later used and uh, in, in royal, for royal foundation deposits. So it's interesting what kinds of practices are centered on votive objects other than just offering them into the temple. They were redeposited, they were used for foundation uh, deposits. Um, earlier in the, in the 20th century, this uh, shrine uh, dedicated to the goddess uh, Sated was found and the inscriptions tell us which king uh, dedicated this temple. It was Pepe the first. And uh, on top in the lunette of this, uh, of this Neus, you can see a secondary uh, inscription over here, um, uh, which is by Merin Ra. Um, the, this Neus was, was found out of context. So we don't know exactly where it was originally placed, whether in the temple or as somebody else suggested, it could have been part of the town gate, the gate into the town. 
we don't know. But I still believe that the traditional interpretation um, of this nais as having formed part of the temple equipment uh, makes more sense. And originally, when it was found, um, the idea was that a statue of the uh, uh, goddess Sated was placed in the niche of the nais. So the nais was erected in the sanctuary of the uh, Sated uh, shrine. Uh, and uh, the idea behind this was that uh, Pippi the first uh, dedicated the shrine in order to support the cult of the goddess uh, Sated. Uh, my own reconstruction is a little bit uh, different. Um, I believe that the uh, shrine was placed on the mud brick uh, pedestal in the center. So I believe that um, this nais here was placed on this pedestal. Uh, and uh, that this room actually was not a forecourt, which implies an open uh, court, but it was a roofed uh, uh, room, uh, but it was not a stone roof. This wouldn't actually uh, make sense in terms also for the mudbrick architecture, but it was a, an organic roof, just as we can see from uh, animal sheds in Egypt today. And these wooden posts over here are similar to those uh, used uh, here. So uh, they are not very uh, massive. So in the reconstruction, they look like uh, rather massive beams, but they were 10 centimeters in diameter. So some uh, suggested when I presented this, they said, oh, it's not possible that these uh, uh, posts would uh, uh, carry a roof. But I think this speaks to the contrary. It is possible. Uh, and um, so, uh, and then the, uh, the second idea is, so the, um, uh, in terms of the reconstruction of the temple, what I believe happened is that this pedestal originally was a mud brick pillar. When the Neas arrived in the late 6th dynasty, it was, uh, this, uh, it was cut and the uh, Neas was placed on top of it. And then, only then, these uh, wooden posts uh, came into the stratigraphy of the temple. We see this when we look at the layers. Uh, these uh, wooden posts are later than the uh, uh, than the, uh, uh, the the pedestal. So, because the pedestal was now used as um, a support for the shrine, now a different kind of roof construction was needed. Um, okay, so this is the reconstruction of the temple. Um, the other historical implication of this reconstruction is that I think it was not a statue of the uh, goddess Satan that was placed in the niche, but it was a, a statue of King Pippi the First. Uh, more precisely, uh, from parallels, particularly from Dendra, a seed festival statue. Um, and um, the historical background for this is that we know from inscriptions uh, that uh, kings of the 6th dynasty built um, statue shrines for their own worship in several provincial temples in Egypt. And I think that this is also uh, what happened here at uh, Elephantini. So that's the, uh, the reconstruction. It means that a new kind of practice Cult sway into the temple. It was not only about the veneration of the deity in the sanctuary, uh, the form of which we don't know very well because of the destruction from the uh, New Kingdom, uh, 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 New Kingdom shaft that destroyed the temple layers here. Uh, but in addition to uh, venerating the goddess Satis, it was also the king, uh, Peter the First, who now was uh, worshipped. And this uh, cult, of course, uh, also had economic implications because it was funded. So the priests being involved in worshipping the statue, they received uh, the uh, offerings. I mean, this is the reconstruction. They received the offerings that were made uh, to the royal statue. Right, so this is the um, world of practice in this uh, temple of uh, Elephantini. I'd like to show you now a second example, uh, namely um, the shrine at Nedissa in uh, Lower Nubia, and uh, Megissa was used as a four in the uh, Middle Kingdom, and then in the New Kingdom, people started to settle there permanently. Uh, this is how the four looks like, uh, and um, so basically it's military architecture, but there was also a, a temple um, located in this corner over here, uh, and this is how it looks like. So it was a mud brick uh, temple, Combined with a stone-lined, uh, with the stone-lined chapel uh, dedicated uh, to the uh, worship of Tutmosis the Third, um, and what we are interested in is the um, the lesser part of the temple, uh, namely this part over here, 
Uh, this is a secondary chapel. So here again we have uh, the architect of the temple, the stone line sanctuary. And we are interested in this part over here, the Hatha shrine, a very uh, modest uh, arrangement. So uh, it's mud bricks only. You have a few uh, slabs here, broken slabs used to pave uh, the entrance to the uh, to the shrine. You have a basin uh, that was that leaked. So we see there was repair. There was a hole in it, uh, and then um, the actual the inner part of the sanctuary. Uh, was made of two uh, roughly hewn stone blocks, probably for a statue, a little figurine of the deity Hatha. Uh, the Temple of Megiza is a little bit like Pompeii, so um, it's, uh, it's published by Verbotaire. So uh, a really uh, exciting example, you, uh, you have the feeling you look into a temple that was just left, people have just left the temple, and you see what uh, remains. Um, so this is the uh, this pedestal for the figurine of the uh, of, uh, of Hase, um, a couple of broken uh, shards of pottery located over here, uh, and uh, this is how the pottery looks like. So it's open bowls for drinking and food, stands uh, on which uh, the bowls were placed, or you have a combination of a stand and a bowl, as you can see over here. So this is uh, pottery for consumption and probably some food and offering the offerings were uh, made. Um, also, a few chalices were found that looked like uh, this. Again, this is for drinking. Uh, and um, we can assume that uh, uh, food and drink was offered to the deity and then later consumed in the shrine. Uh, it's also interesting to know that this kind of pottery is absent from the temple decoration of the same period, uh, uh, which means that the, uh, the temples uh, of the New Kingdom, they use a repertoire of uh, of uh, vessels that looks different from the actual practice, but that's a footnote only. Okay, so we see here something about the uh, practices, and in addition, we also um, also a couple of uh, votive objects were found. Some of them were secondarily deposited and collected uh, in this vessel, and the vessel was then placed into the sanctuary. Uh, as you can see here, this is what uh, came out of the vessel, and these objects included. Uh, uh, female figurines of a certain type, again, uh, jewelry, uh, amulets of baboons, uh, so called bees, figurines, uh, other pieces of jewelry, and again, these natural uh, flint, um, <coughs> flint pebbles. So, in essence, um, the, uh, the repertoire of objects is rather uh, similar to um, the objects that were seen at Elephantini Island. Um, and um, the uh, objects, the votive objects, were placed in baskets, um, which are uh, marked in uh, these circles here. This is how the baskets uh, look like. Uh, and um, also a few stele were found, um, indicated over here and here on the photo. Five stele overall, and I show you three. Uh, these were um, these were offered by. Uh, uh, by women. Uh, the stele are of a rather low quality, so compared to many other stele that we know. Uh, but of course, uh, in the context of, these, of this uh, sanctuary, these stele is already the top ranking clientele, so the top ranking people who would make offerings are these women, whose title is a uh, nevet pair, so uh, mistress of the house. We would usually consider this as very low ranking and poor stele. But just to get an, an idea of the social profile of the sanctuary, uh, in, the, uh, in this context, they are, uh, they are actually quite uh, high ranking. So again, we see here um, the result of practice in the temple. <clears throat> we have here an indication of the range of people who made offerings, uh, probably um, women in the first place. So this has been also extrapolated from the, from the jewelry, from the female figurines. Of course, there's a lot of hypothesis building here. Uh, but uh, in the first place, what we see in the archaeology is um, the result of uh, practice. I would like now to uh, move a little bit closer to the interpretation of this uh, material. So how do we uh, interpret the uh, visual uh, imagery that we've just uh, seen? And I'm going to focus here on the third millennium evidence from Elephantini. Um, it is very interesting to ask the question why the material looks similar in the New Kingdom 1,000 years later, 
but there are also some votive types that look different. So for example, the female figurines, this is a kind of votive type that we don't find in the Old Kingdom. Uh, and for all ideas of uh, local religion being slow and very little changes on the local level, it's just the elites uh, where new ideas are introduced and local people just behave the same. It's interesting that on a local level, the repertoire uh, changes. So uh, going back to the uh, third millennium, uh, we could now ask the question, uh, why was a crocodile used as a votive um, type? And um, one, I think, intuitive approach is to say, okay, what does the crocodile mean in ancient Egypt? If we know what the crocodile means in ancient Egypt, we can explain why it was used in votive practice. And this is what has been done with the material. So the kind of interpretation proposed is uh, the, uh, the crocodile uh, bathes in the river Nile during the night, so this means regeneration. The crocodile mm -hmm. means regeneration. People use the crocodile because they pray for regeneration. And the crocodile is green, and green is a color that means so-and-so in ancient Egypt. And the crocodile is associated with sexual power in the pyramid texts. So it was a prey for, uh, so people prayed for uh, sexual power and fertility. It's always about fertility, basically. Um, of course, we can, uh, we can uh, approach the material from this uh, corner. The problem is that you can do the same with the frog. And you can do this with uh, the baboons. You will always find some biological uh, properties of these animals where you can say, oh, the, the baboon, they take care of their children. It was a mother who wanted to pray for their children. Or in, at Hierocompolis, you have a couple of scorpions. And the excavator then said, uh, scorpions, oh, the mothers of the scorpions, they also take great care of their children. Uh, and again, so basically everything means everything. So I think it doesn't work. This is not the kind of approach that we can take. Also, the mentioning in the pyramid texts and in other texts, later texts, um, I don't think we can simply project this into uh, this uh, community, 1,000, uh, 1,200 kilometers further south from Memphis. We don't know whether the knowledge that circulated at court was also known in uh, Elephantini. So I think we need to uh, think differently. And uh, I'd like to uh, draw your attention to associated uh, material, a similar material that was found in tombs. And these are the seals and amulets of the late Old Kingdom to the early Middle Kingdom, which has been studied, among others, by um, Ulrike Dubil, on whose interpretation I build uh, my uh, ideas. So what you can see here is um, amulets uh, showing a scorpion, for example, over here. Uh, you have chicken quails. This is actually a hieroglyph with a royal crown. So it's um, a kind of imagery that was appropriated in the first intermediate period in a provincial context. I should say that this imagery, that these seals and amulets, were not found in the uh, cemeteries of the court, in the residence, but in provincial contexts. Uh, we see also, let me just uh, check where we see, uh, we have a lion over here. Uh, we have the Ujjad eye. Uh, there are, oh, where is the baboon? Do we have a baboon here? Uh, no. Uh, and we also have, um, it's the, the amulets that, uh, uh, that, uh, that are pierced, but also the uh, button seals and scarab seals uh, have the same kind of imagery. Um, so we have here animals, we have a hare, uh, we have crocodiles over here. It's the same kind of imagery that was used on the seals, and later this kind of imagery disintegrated in the first intermediate period. And in the Middle Kingdom, we have a combination of hieroglyphic signs and floral and geometrical patterns. So the point I'd like to make here is that, um, and this is what uh, Ulrike de Biel has shown very clearly, and uh, something that I also worked on, is the overlap um, of the imagery between the votive objects and um, the seals and amulets found in provincial cemeteries. So the temple context and the funerary context overlap here. Uh, so uh, a frog as an, uh, a votive type, a frog as an amulet the scorpion and the scorpion, a crocodile and the crocodile, and so forth and so forth. It's a very strong uh, overlap. Uh, and these seals and amulets were placed in burials of low to mid-ranking uh, rural uh, communities. Uh, so this is the, um, the, 
the excavation by Guy Brunton in the 1920s, published in the 1920s, where you can see um, the object repertoire of individual uh, burials. Uh, you have beads, uh, you have here a lion strung on a, uh, together with beads, you, <clears throat> cowrie shells, a hand, you have a lion, uh, this is a debased uh, woman uh, of uh, GL means glazed faience. Uh, so this is how uh, the same material looks in its archaeological context, at least as it was published. And Ulrike de Beer has then uh, made a connection between this material and a slightly later papyrus, um, which is called in Egyptology uh, Papyrus for the Protection of Mother and Child in Berlin. So it's dated to uh, the late Middle Kingdom or New Kingdom, the manuscript, but probably the, uh, the content is older. So uh, one of the spells uh, reads like this spell for fastening an amulet for a child, a young bird. Are you warm in the nest? Are you warm in the coppice? Is your mother not with you? Is your sister not with you to let you breathe? Is your wet nurse not there to provide protection? Have me brought a pallet of gold, a pallet of garnet, a seal, a crocodile, and a hen? in order for the enemy of the West to be repelled. This is protection. And then comes the instruction, what you actually should do, to be recited over a pallet of gold, a pallet of garnet, a seal, a crocodile, and a hand. It may be strung on a string as an amulet and be placed around the neck of a child. So basically, her interpretation is, and I think she's right, what we see here in, the, uh, in this kind of medical, uh, magical instruction is what we see in the funerary context of the provincial uh, of provincial cow in Kibir. Um, this is the kinds of um, the strings of amulets that were placed around the neck of a child, uh, for example, to uh, provide protection through uh, ritual spells uh, uttered um, over these uh, uh, over these images. The uh, it's interesting to see what kind of people are involved uh, in the uh, in this magical spell, medical, medical spell, um, it's all, so this is for the protection of a child, and the people mentioned are the, the mother, the wet nurse, uh, and I think in this case, but it's always about the close social environment of uh, the individual uh, that is uh, protected or for which a certain magical practice is uh, carried And the same uh, kind of world we encounter uh, with the letters to the dead for which uh, questions may be directed to Gianluca Mignacci who has recently uh, republished and reinterpreted uh, a letter to the dead found again at uh, in the same uh, in the same cemetery at Kawad Kibir. Uh, these letters to the dead are directed to the uh, recently deceased uh, and people would ask, uh, in this case, for example, why uh, are you doing evil to me, my mother, although I have done everything good for you, and why are you listening now to my brother, who's also dead, and whom I uh, transported back to his village, uh, and now he is instigating against me. Uh, so it's a complaint to the mother. Um, and these letters to the dead, we know a couple of them, uh, they also uh, revolve around the close social environment of the individuals uh, involved. Um, what we don't hear much about is uh, the kinds of things that would, you would read in syntheses of ancient Egyptian religion. There's no talk about the king here in the Letters of the Dead. Deities are mentioned sometimes. Ma'at, the uh, justice and order, a key word for any uh, uh, um, yeah, for any uh, summary of ancient Egyptian religion is basically absent or is doesn't play a great role. Um, so all the key ideas of ancient Egyptian religion play a rather little role. Rather, what uh, what is very important is social relationships. It's all about um, the close social environment, mothers, children, the wet nurse, the sister, the brothers, the here's the ancestors. It's always about uh, the ego, which is in the center, and uh, 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 people positioned uh, very close to him. The point I'd like to make here is that um, the imagery fits into this world of a religion of close social environment. It's not because the crocodile meant so-and-so or because the frog uh, in ancient Egyptian religion means so-and-so, but what we're dealing with is an imagery uh, that was used to articulate religious thoughts of the close social environment. So the kinds of praise and vows and prayers 
uh, that would be associated with votive practice, I think, are very similar uh, to what we see here in the Letters of the Dead or what we see in magical practice. So uh, the bottom line is, uh, from, uh, from the practice, we can extrapolate a meaning different from uh, what we would uh, assume from uh, text and imagery. Right, um, now the local milieu uh, is sometimes, has sometimes, uh, yeah, almost is timeless. So there are many interpretations of rural Egypt uh, today, which is projected into the past. So uh, a famous example is Winifred Blackman's The Fellahin of Upper Egypt, where she uh, does ethnographic fieldwork in the 1920s. And the final chapter is, okay, now, basically, my brother, who was an Egyptologist at Liverpool, um, my brother tells me that my findings are very similar to what he sees in ancient Egypt. So basically, over the past 5,000 years, at the local level, in rural Egypt, no change. Everything remained the same. And I think it's very important that when we go to small-scale contexts and to local milieus and local communities, we also need to historicize them. There was change, and I'd like to show you um, how we can approach uh, change at a local level. Um, I'd like to show uh, the development of, th of four uh, local community shrines um, located at Elephantini, Hierocompolis, Abides, and Tel Ibrahim Awad in the Delta. So beginning with uh, Elephantini in the south, uh, this has now entered the textbooks as a standard example of temple development in Egypt. So it started in the top row, it started as a small community shrine, and then the temple became bigger and bigger, uh, and kingship penetrated into these local community shrines, and uh, kings started to erect monumental buildings. So the middle building, uh, the, the building in the middle row, um, is the reconstructed temple of um, Zenwasha the uh, first, and this is the temple of the new kingdom of Hatshepsut and Tutmosis the third. Um, so temples became bigger, and basically the historical, the macro historical story, story behind it is. Uh, kingship penetrated into these temples and appropriated local cults. Now, how does this process look at other uh, sites? Uh, this is Tel Ibrahim Awad in the Eastern Delta, and also in the Old Kingdom, we have here a rather little community shrine, so very similar to what we've seen at Elephantini. So Elephantini, the, uh, the, the, uh, the conclusion is Elephantini is exemplary, it's not an exception, but it's, uh, we find uh, parallels elsewhere. This is how the, Mugrig, the small Mudrik shrine uh, of Tel Ibrahim looks like in the Old Kingdom. And this shrine that you can see here uh, on the map is this one, and it was later superimposed by a larger building. So basically, it's the same kind of process here at Tel Ibrahim Awad. A small a community shrine was probably repre replaced by a more formal, presumably a royal building, perhaps of the earlier uh, Middle Kingdom. And also at Tel Ibrahim Awad, we see, see the same kind of votive practice. Uh, so you see uh, some of the objects that were offered uh, here, again, crocodiles, certain types of ships, and uh, other material. So all, uh, overall, a very similar setting to uh, Elephantini. Um, the story is very different if we uh, look at Hierocompolis. So Hierocompolis, which is located just a little bit north to uh, Elephantini, was a central place of Egyptian uh, state formation. And of course, it's famous for the Nama palette uh, that has been found here. So the Nama palette that you can see on the photo is the first monumental display of Egyptian kingships. So the palette is six, uh, 63 centimeters uh, high. Uh, and um, on the uh, left-hand side, you can see a the archaeological uh, situation uh, with the temple of uh, Horus, the god of Hierocompolis, placed in the center. This wall probably is New Kingdom. So for the uh, Old Kingdom and the Third Millennium, you have to remove this wall from your imagination. Uh, and this wall here is probably Old Kingdom, uh, and this is late pre-dynastic to early dynastic. Uh, so uh, this uh, in the center, this here, is a, uh, an artificial a uh, mound of sand held together with a stone revetment. So very different type of architecture, rather monumental. And as we can see here from the Nama Palette, uh, and very different from Elephantini, we see here a massive royal presence uh, at Hierocompolis. 
And this is also confirmed by the uh, objects that were found associated with the temples. For example, the stone vessels can be dated rather um, well. Uh, we find a lot of stone vessels of the late pre-dynastic, early dynastic period. This is actually the period of Nama. So when Nama offered his palette, there were also other high-ranking people who offered these prestigious stone vessels. None of the stone vessels dates uh, uh, date to the early dynastic period, to the early Old Kingdom, or to the late Old Kingdom. So um, although hundreds of stone vessels were found, we can exclude that a lot of uh, stone vessels were offered after uh, Nama had offered his uh, palette. And then we have a, uh, another a range of very prestigious, high, uh, high lead objects, beautiful uh, ivory figurines with inlaid eyes, probably of lapis lazuli, the eyes inlaid, and uh, these uh, mace heads, typical of Hierocompolis. And we also find, apart from the Nama palette, we find uh, ceremonial mace heads of Nama and of King Scorpion. So it's all dating to the uh, late pre-dynastic, early dynastic uh, period. Uh, the same is true for these large, large vessels. Parallels only come from royal tombs. So we are, we are also dealing with a communal, so with a, a community shrine. But this is an example, different from Elephantini, different from Tepe Ibrahim Awad, where kings in the late pre-dynastic, early dynastic period had a massive interest in. So this is uh, how it looks like when kings like Nama are interested in a temple. So a very different social setting of this community shrine uh, than uh, Elephantini and Tepe Ibrahim Awad. Abides is a sign that you know very well, not least from the uh, talk of Paul Whelan last week's, uh, week here, so I won't uh, uh, repeat much of what he said. This is how Abides North, the temple area, looks like today, and where you see this little pond here, uh, this is uh, probably the temple area of the Old Kingdom, where Petri excavated um, a series of buildings. Uh, this is how they look like. Um, so these are uh, enclosure walls, um, a series of buildings, and this is there's, there's some debate whether or not this is the temple building of the Old Kingdom, and I think it's uh, rather clear that it, it, this is uh, the temple building because of the accumulation of other finds around it. Uh, also at Abides, just as at Elephantini, Tebbi Mawad, we have these kinds of votive figurines. They were also deposited uh, secondarily in these deposits. Um, the pits of which are indicated as M64, 65, and 69. Uh, and uh, so the picture here um, is fairly similar for the Old Kingdom to Elephantine and Tel Ibrahim Awad. However, in the Sixth Dynasty, there is a change. Here again is a rather uh, active royal interest in the temple. Um, nowhere else have many uh, royal inscriptions be been found in community shrines um, of the Sixth Dynasty as it. Uh, uh, so uh, this is Pepe II, we see here Mary and Rhee, uh, Pepe, presumably Pepe I. There are also a couple of stone vessels with uh, royal inscriptions. These were probably given to uh, high-ranking officials at Abides, and they offered them into the temple. Um, uh, this is also something we don't see at Elephantini, uh, for example. So suddenly in the Sixth Dynasty, we see here rather increased royal interest in the temple. Um, and this is because um, the, um, the kings of the Sixth Dynasty married into the family of Abides. We need to understand the local history uh, of the archaeological record. I'll skip this and uh, come to the uh, comparison of the different temples. Uh, um, Tel Ibrahim Awad is not added here, but if we look at the archaeological remains of the temple and uh, we zoom in on the uh, votive material, we see here differences. This is another important point, talking about uh, local milieus. It's not all the same. It's not the local milieu, but it's very different from side to side. We see at Elefantini, uh, most of the votive objects uh, were made of faience. Very few were made of prestigious materials. At Abides, we also see a range of faience objects um, here, uh, and only a few others of uh, ivory and of stone. And Hierocompolis, an entirely different social setting of the community shrine. Uh, we have a massive presence here of uh, ivory objects, of stone objects. Uh, sorry, we have, um, of, so these are uh, ivory objects. There were a few finals objects only, but a massive presence here of uh, stone objects and even some semi precious stones. 
So um, the local milieus are very different from side to side. It's a different range of people that engage in votive practice. If we try to plot this on a, di on a diachronic chart, uh, this is an attempt um, to show what happens uh, in terms of the macro-historical development uh, of the local milieus and the micro-histories behind it. So overall, if you zoom in on the temples, we see here an increased integration of the temples into royal uh, culture. Uh, so we have seen, for example, the Aeneas of Pico the First at Lefantini. I've shown you at Abidus, um, the various royal inscriptions of the Sixth Dynasty, but many more than uh, at Elephantini, so this is slightly higher ranking. Um, the origins of the temple tradition in Egypt, um, uh, I would argue, are not in royal hands. Um, Hierocompolis is an absolute uh, exception among all temples. Um, Elephantini and Abidus and Tanika Rimawar are much more likely to uh, show the, uh, the standard uh, local milieu. Uh, Hierocompolis, of course, was interesting for the kings because the temple was dedicated to Horus, which is uh, the, the, uh, the god that embodies the reigning king. So there was some royal ideology underpinning uh, royal vote objects. The point I'd like to make here, uh, without focusing on the details, uh, what I'd like to uh, say here is there is a macro historical development overall in Egypt. Uh, however, in each case, we have to contextualize this um, development in the micro histories of each temple. Uh, that's basically what I, I think where archaeology can play a uh, particularly a uh, great role. Um, right, and I have one uh, final uh, comment on the integration of archaeology images and texts. So now I'm coming back to some of the thoughts uh, I've started the lecture with. Uh, and here I'd like to leave the communities, uh, uh, community shrines aside and uh, use a different case study. Uh, namely, the um, cemeteries of the Old Kingdom at Dashur. So Dashur, as you know, is the uh, location of the pyramids of King Snefru in the 4th dynasty, uh, which are over here and there. The site was reused in the uh, Middle Kingdom, and these are the Middle Kingdom pyramids over here. And we are now focusing on this cemetery here, a rigidly planned uh, cemetery uh, predating the uh, Giza cemetery. Uh, and one of the tombs was uh, excavated by Nicole Alexanian. It's the uh, tomb of Prince uh, Nietzsche Arpahe, um, who was the son of uh, King Snefru. So this is the Mastaba, uh, and the Mastaba has two cult niches. This is the more important cult niche in the south, and the smaller one in the north, with the chapel that was built in front of it. Here is a ramp that led to the uh, roof of the uh, Mastaba. Uh, this is the burial shaft that leads down into a burial chamber, and a portcullis cool stone had been used in order to seal the chamber. And this is uh, this uh, uh, this uh, feature over here. And there were also a few post holes that were found uh, to the south of this uh, mastaba. Um, many uh, pots were found uh, around the mastaba, predominantly uh, bread molds and beer jars of the early. Uh, old Kingdom, so um, that's the period of King Snefru, and a little bit later, as well as stands. So again, uh, you can place um, a bowl on top of these stands. Uh, and another interesting feature are these miniature vessels, so dummy vessels that we can't use uh, regionally. They're very small and very roughly made. Uh, uh, they were probably not used for a ritual, but they only uh, symbolize a ritual. The region wasn't carried out. Uh, but there was also other um, pottery that was used, uh, namely this bowl here for burning incense. So here you can see uh, the ground of the bowl. This part over here is this. And the cover had these holes so the uh, fume could uh, come out. This is a, um, a mud uh, loaf of bread. So it's not real bread, again, it's only, it symbolizes bread. Uh, and uh, also a shard was found, uh, probably for mixing uh, colors uh, ritually. Now, uh, it's interesting to look at the uh, distribution of the pottery, uh, and I highlight uh, two uh, 
uh, two areas in the tomb. Uh, I'm following very much in my interpretation of Nicole Alexandria, so I'm just reporting her results. So bread molds and beer jars were found predominantly along the ramp. Uh, and this ritual uh, material, this and this and the model uh, bread of loaf, was found uh, here at the bottom of the burial shaft in front of the uh, burial chamber. So uh, Nicole Alexandria um, uh, um, assumes uh, that what happened here um, before uh, the uh, burial chamber is um, a ritual after closing uh, the burial chamber. Um, and that this material here was cons consumed uh, while people were, uh, yeah, were, while people were climbing uh, the, uh, the, the ramp. And her major, and this is now where the overlap of the archaeology, we focus on archaeology. Uh, now we look at um, images and text, and there are uh, a few representations of similar settings. And this is the one from the tomb of Derech Eni. It's not the same tomb, it's a different tomb. But we can see here parts of the Mastaba of Derech Eni. And we see here the southern uh, uh, false door, the cultic niche. We see a ram. Uh, that leads on top of the roof, uh, and along the, uh, the ramp, um, there are several bread molds and beer jars sealed that uh, were found next to the uh, ramp. Uh, and on top of the ramp, so here are offering bearers, um, and they reach here a maze or a shrine with the statue of uh, with the statue of Debech Eni. So we could assume that uh, we could project this also in the tomb of nature Ahre. So uh, the pottery, the beer jars, and the bread molds were found next to the, uh, to the ram. We see here part of the funeral, and on top of the roof, uh, perhaps in front of the mummy of uh, Nietzsche Ahre, which has not been preserved, some rituals took place, and then the mummy was brought down the burial shaft, and uh, the burial chamber was closed. Um, so here, um, I think the projection of visual material into the archaeology works very well. We also learn uh, what else happened during the funeral. So here are ritual dances, female dances, uh, and we have here inscriptions uh, that tell us what, they may, what, the, what the name of the ritual is and how this uh, offering table is called. Um, and um, here, this is the um, offering scene, uh, the offering uh, table. Uh, which, uh, again, uh, is uh, combined with uh, certain uh, rituals, which you can see here. Nicole Alexandria assumes that the, the rituals that are implied in the uh, offering table, so uh, making bread offerings, um, burning incense, uh, libation offerings, uttering certain spells, so for example, um, that this uh, funerary cult, which we know, or we assume, happened above ground, was initialized um, in front of the burial chamber. So before people would approach regularly the deceased and make offerings, uh, the first uh, offering took place uh, in front of the burial chamber. So this is an example of how we can integrate uh, material culture with images and uh, texts. In this case, it works very well, and I think this is a great example. Uh, my only um, addition to this is uh, the question, why does it work so well? So why do you hear archaeology, images, and text speak the same language? And I think the answer is because we're talking about the same social milieu. We're talking here about practices um, at court. It's the same kind of people engaged in the same kind of practices. And for this reason, there's a, a good overlap. Um, and I think the same is also true for the provincial context. This works quite well. Because again, for the uh, letters to the dead and the medical practice and the uh, amulets, the overlap there is quite good because it's the same kind of people interacting, doing the same kind of practices. So here I think um, this is what uh, could uh, contribute to exploring ancient religion, to think religion in the first place through social relationships and social milieus and the kinds of interaction that took place between people so rather than beginning top down from the ideas and then try to reconstruct what the practices have meant. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jan.
fascinating, and I'm overall interested in, in your topic, you know. Uh, I wonder if any of you has some questions or any curiosity? Qualche domanda? I just, I just want to express uh, to thank Richard for this um, really very interesting uh, lecture. And uh, I completely appreciate, of course, your methodology because it's uh, exactly what we need. I try, I try to learn uh, the students that we need to contextualize, we need to historicize. This is especially important for uh, the history of the Egyptian religion. Uh, so it's really important what you are doing, uh, and uh, I'm very, I really congratulate you for it. Uh, just a question about the uh, uh, Hierapolis. Don't you think that uh, Hierapolis was uh, uh, different from the other examples? Because Hierapolis was the center, was not provincial in that period. Mm. Really, all the kingship ideology and of course the cult of Horus, as you told mm -hmm. it was born there. So this is the, the difference uh, between uh, this was just what I was thinking. Um, I think you're very right. Uh, to subsume Hierocompolis um, under the provincial temples mm -hmm. is not quite um, so uh, simple uh, for the reasons that you say. And of course, Hierocompolis also has a prehistory. So if we go to the pre-dynastic remains of Hierocompolis, so just predating what I've shown for a couple of generations, uh, we see that there is a lot of elite activity centered on the cultic plaza, and the material uh, objects that were used on the rituals on this plaza connect to the elite pre-dynastic cemetery. So we see here how um, kingship is emerging uh, locally at Hierocompolis. So it may not be provincial at the, uh, in, at the state formation period, uh, it's provincial from the uh, from the later Old Kingdom perspective. So then it has declined into a provincial temple, still of relevance. Uh, but uh, yes, I think um, I think my uh, point here is that uh, Hierocomplex is not the only, exa only example. You could also refer to Koptos, where we have the great Koptos Colossi. You could also say, well, this is not really provincial and common. This is already something bigger. I think what is interesting is to compare these different shrines in the same period. So um, at Hierocompolis, we also have material that we found at, find at Elephantini. We also have uh, simple uh, mud uh, votives. We have fibrous votives. So there's also a local community making votive offerings. But on top of that, we also have uh, the royal activities. But you're very right. It's a different, um, it's a different social setting of the temple. That's right. Mm. I have one observation or question. I mean, I see the role of uh, cocodrel is rather prominent, or at least you have the, the cocodrel. I wonder what happened in the next step, in the second phase in the Middle Kingdom, when the cocodrel almost disappeared from the public mm -hmm. offerings, while it's replaced by the hippo. And I think the uh, hippos are not so prominent. But there are some examples, but not so much as is in the second phase. Do you have any explanation for this? Or? Mm. Um, <clears throat> so my first answer is no. It's exactly the kind of question that we should be asking. Uh, this is what I mentioned with the Megissa material in the New Kingdom. Very similar practice, very similar, a similar social setting. Many of the objects are similar, but some disappear and some are new, like the fertility figurines. And I think this is also the same is true for the uh, Middle Kingdom, where you have these uh, sceneries, you have these playful uh, objects. Um, uh, so, um, no, I think this is exactly a, a question uh, I would probably be asking back. <laughs> so, how do, you ex how do we explain that for the same kind of practice, suddenly a different imagery um, appears? But, um, no, I don't have an answer yet. I, I have an idea, but it's too long to explain now. Right, and okay. That sounds the interesting. The article that's easier. Okay. But, uh, I, the, the problem is the copyright that I expect with more, with more frequency in the middle of the mobile. It's almost absent. We have three examples. All right, so okay. Out of mm -hmm. 1,000. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Some other questions? Last one, then we go to eat. This <laughs> so, 
in the light of what you said, what do you think about the personal piety of romance? Do you think that is a specific phenomenon of the New Kingdom with forerunners, of course, or that is just a difference in display of personal practices, personal hmm. beliefs? Um, the um, devotive practice um, centered on campus, what we can see in the archaeological record, it's not that clear, but I think uh, it's uh, fair to come to, to the conclusion. The mechanism is, as soon as kingship penetrates into these temples, local people are pushed out of the temple, and we see local hierarchies emerging, uh, and we also see central um, uh, uh, officials being involved in the temple of Sated during processions, for example, so it's now um, a new hierarchy, and the top-ranking people now control the temple. People are pushed to the periphery of the temple. And a very nice example of this is the temple of Ptah at Memphis, where we can see um, along the perimeter wall that runs around the temple, this is where people now uh, have, have, where they deposited uh, their uh, votive objects and the ear stele. And we have prayers that were uh, spoken uh, uh, at the um, perimeter wall, the enclosure wall of the temple. So it's the same practice, but it happens in a different uh, context, namely um, not in the inside of the temple, but at the uh, at the periphery. Why they don't put, uh, they don't place the figurines in the virus in this time? Mm. Yeah. They place amulets, mm. fine. Mm. Why they don't feel that they should place also figurines? Mm. Yeah, that's they it. Also model, the, the small mm -hmm. models like in Jeopardy, all that uh, mm -hmm. they have it. Why they don't have figurines? Um, um, this is what you see in the Middle Kingdom, don't you? So, where you see the figurines in the burials. Uh, yeah, again, I mean, the why questions are always the most uh, difficult ones. Um, I mean, one possible answer could be that uh, while you are adopting the, uh, the imagery in the temples is a little bit older than the imagery in the tombs. So we see the kind of the, uh, the amulets that I've shown are late Old Kingdom and a little bit later, whereas the uh, votive material is a little bit earlier. So we, I would assume uh, that the votive material inspired the iconography for local uh, religious practices. And what they, um, the, uh, the votive objects are, are palm size, so they are quite convenient to hold in the hand. And I could imagine that um, the amulet practices are um, so the when when this imagery arrived in the uh, in the tomb context, it was contextualized with amulet practices. So it's not uh, putting a votive object in the tomb, but making it amulet because we know amulets already earlier. I mean, this is just one hypothesis. Right? It's not a definite answer. Uh, people could, of course, we can't predict. Uh, People could, of uh, course, uh, have taken just the uh, votive objects, placed in the tomb, and uh, ready. But um, my, yeah, my interpretation would be it's because it was contextualized with existing amuletic practices, and this is because uh, this one was uh, made smaller, uh, so it could be strong on the uh, But just one idea. Okay. If we're going to write anything, right, thank you again, our speaker. <laughs>